Shalom Aleichem and welcome back, Rabbi Dr. Eliezer Brat. What a treat to get to speak to you again during Mesechtas Chagiga. We've gotten a lot of feedback. People have asked. They hear you go through Gedolim and Lechab Reisvarim very quickly and they ask, please, could you slow down, talk about some of the ones you mentioned a little more by Arichos, give us some more background. So here we go. We're going to pilot this type of episode of talking about a specific Gadol. And today, as promised, we're going to dis- we're going to discuss and speak about Elia Gutmacher. And we're talking about him now because he has Svarim on Chagiga, which are a little bit more well-known. And we're going to discuss you know, how certain Gadolim people don't really know about. They become hidden and they get discovered later on. And he's one of them, Rebelli Gutmacher. So, Rebbe Eliezer, why don't you start with a brief bio, who he was, when did he live, when was he born, who were his colleagues, before you get into the details. Okay, so Rebbe Eliezer Gutmacher, by the, way of, by the way of introduction, is many G'daylem during their lifetimes are famous. And as we're going to see, Rebbe Eliezer Gutmacher was extremely famous, but afterwards they're almost completely forgotten. When Giving an example of such a, of, of a gadol that was very famous in his lifetime and then afterwards becomes forgotten, I like to always talk about Rabbi Avram Abala Pesler, the dying of Vilna after the Grah dies, who basically comes onto the scene in Vilna in about 1802, or somewhere around that time. And then for the next 30 something years, he's the gadol, one of the gadol Hadar of all of Europe. Um, but, and everyone knew of him at that time, afterwards, he, after he dies, slowly, slowly, he's forgotten about by most people. Today, the way people hear about him is always a, many Rabbanim, somehow in Rosh Hashanah at night, or somewhere on Rosh Hashanah, mix into a speech somehow, the famous Shaila, if someone forgets to say, HaMelech HaKadosh, on Rosh Hashanah at night, if you have to go back, it's a Chiddush of Ram Abel that you do not have to, brought down the Chai Adam and the Mishnah Brura. And he was a good friend of the Chayyadam, so some of his chedushim were recorded by the Chayyadam. And that's how he sadly um, is known, but in his time he was a tremendous gadol. More recently, Mechon Yishalayim printed some material that they have of his, but from what we, from what's understood, he had much, much more out there. So, Rebelli Gutmacher, also, as we'll see, is also, we'll see that he was a very famous gadol in his time, and he pretty much gets forgotten about, and we'll discuss throughout this presentation, how he sort of became back on the scene a little bit. Okay, now, during the corona, um, for some people it's still going on, depending on where you are, depending on all different things, but there was a famous letter of Rabbi Kivager that was quoted unbelievable amount of times. In the beginning of corona, I actually tried to keep track of all the different ways how it was being used. It was used in all different sides, in different arguments, different conversations, different aspects. And maybe one day we'll try to write up about it. But Rabbi Kivega wrote a letter where he gave advice how for how to deal with um, at that time the 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 plagues that had been going on, killing people, what to do, advice, practical advice, how to daven and shul, all these things. Who was this letter written to? So almost no one focuses on it. Was written to the young rebellious Gutmacher, and Rabbi Kivega calls him Yedid. Nafshi Umachman Luvavi Harav Hamuflig Haravu Baki Haritz Vashinam Rebelio Avdezum Falshin. Now, who who is that? This is our Rebelio Gutmacher. He was a very young Rav at the time. He's born in 1796, and it seems he's one of the greatest Talmidim of Rabbi Kivega, although we don't know. We know Rabbi Kivega had hundreds and hundreds of Talmidim, but we don't know much about all the different Talmidim, different biographies of Rabbi Kivega, and there are many try to track down various Talmidim, um, list them, but we don't know more than sometimes if they're a Talmud or not. Throughout, I hope to deal with more discussing his relationship with Rabbi Kivager later on. But he becomes a Rav in Falshin, and then eventually in Gretz, he dies in 1874. So he has, a, he, he lives a nice, he's pretty active for a while. Okay, now, what he's famous, where people might have heard of him, is in Yonim of Eretz Yisrael. He's, he's on the same side in some aspects with Rabbi Kalisher, Niyanim of Eretz Yisrael, and I'm not going to be focusing on this aspect at all due to time limits. Rabbi Tzvi Kalisher was also Talmud of Rabbi Kivega. But besides for that, if you look around, you will not find so much in his lifetime him coming up in print literature so much. But he seems to have been a well-known German gadol at the time. Okay, so what were the svarim that were printed v'chayav? A couple svarim printed v'chayav until later on, more recently, um, they started printing a lot more of his Torah. 
Okay, so basically it's interesting. Is He seems to, now we could say, with information that we have today, we know he was very, very prolific, but he does not print much in his lifetime. Towards the end of his life, in 1873, he prints a sefer called Nachos Tzvi. This sefer has four svarim. One is a sefer called Nachos Tzvi, which is a sefer of his son. What happened is he had a son, he had a few children, but his oldest son was very hush of a person. His name was Reb Tzvi, who actually took him over, took over to be the Rav of Falshim before, after when he went to Gretz. Um, anyway, he dies tragically at the age of 53 without children in the year 1871. So Rebbe Yagumacher wanted to uh, print something of his, of this Reb Tzvi, so he printed two svarim of his. One is a Sefer Nachal Tzvi, which is relating to Masech Tzvi Vamas. Mertz Hashem, maybe we'll talk a little bit more about it, Masech Tzvi Vamas. And a Sefer Kema Fereshes on Kinan. Obviously, these are not two um, learn um, um, for Hamoyin Am, so to speak. So Rebbe Yagumacher writes that he's going to print one Sefer of his own called Tzafnas Paneach, and, and, and a fourth sefer called Shalom B'Palmalio Shel Milo. Tzafnas Paneach is a running commentary on the famous Gemaras in Baba Basra, the Galata Gemaras of Rabbi Barachana, um, where Rebel Yugutmacher has a, um, talks, explains these Gemaras in a series of Mamarim. And Shalom B'Palmalio Shel Milo is a various stirists that are found in various Chalakim Shulchan Aruch with the Mechaber and the Ramah, and he's miyash of them in Halacha the Confession. Now, this Safer. Um, in the Askama, he writes the greatness of his son, and about him, he was also a Talmud of Rabbi Kiveiga for a short period of time, but then he was sick, he was shvach, so he ended up going back to learn by his father before he becomes a Rav eventually. And interesting, from the material, which we're going to discuss shortly, turns out we there are various chuvas in, in some of the material that was printed, discussing the hardships that he had, um, um, he was not able to have children, and Rabbi Gutmacher wanted him to divorce his his wife, and there was a whole a lot of tumult about it, very, very fascinating, interesting chuvas that probably would have been, certain people probably would have censored them out, but Rebelli Gutmacher um, printed, um, one of them, I mean, kept them in the collection, he had them, one of the letters he has a chuva is about this topic with the Sherla Meshiv, very interesting material in there. Now, there's another, one last uh, tidbit is that the that there was once the, the Nachas Fi, he didn't print it. He gave it to his children to print for their brother, brother in law, whatever. And it seems that there was some type of issue with Hilcha Shemus, there was some type of printing error. And he also has a different chuva where he talks about that, um, some type of issue that comes up. But basically, bottom line is that these are the only works that he prints in his lifetime. Shortly after he dies, in, in the Vilna Shas and, and some of the Masechtas, there's some Aris of his on, on in Gemara, there's Aris of his in Mishnayis. In 1883, a very unique sefer of his called, called Sukkah Shalom comes out, which we'll discuss um, perhaps at the end, which it, which also it seems to be have been that it was ready for print for in 1854. Okay. But anyway, this is the story of right immediately after his death. So if, we, if we're saying that he dies in 1874, pretty much there's not so much of his, uh, this small work comes out in 1883. Afterwards, basically nothing about him. Um, okay, that's that. That's the first. Okay, fine. So as we've discussed, people really enjoy how you go through the history. You know, of when different svarim of certain mechabrim or ramasakim, <coughs> you know, come to our attention. So what happened next? How many years was there nothing going on? And then when was this revival? Okay, so interesting is I'm not sure what triggered the revival, but in 1969, Rav Bramberger, who authored numerous biographies on Gedolim, and this is volume 24 of his books, he decided to write a book about Rebel Yugutmacher. He wanted material about him, so he, he got access to the archive material that was found in Meister of Cook, um, tons of manuscripts, they gave him full access, and he uses throughout his book, he quotes tons of material, chuvas, and other um, information, letters, and um, kvitloch even, and he writes the book from that. And already reading this book, you could already see that we're dealing with a, a, a very, very unique God, though not the standard German Paisic. Okay, now, in 1979, Tyra starts coming out finally. So we're talking about almost 100 years later. The first is his is, is Tyra on Shas, printed by Michonne Shalayim. At the end, they put out four volumes of his Tyra on Shas. In, 18, in 1984, two massive volumes of Shut. Of, are printed. This was printed by Meister of Cook, which I mentioned was used by Bramberger. In 1990, the Sukkah Shalom 
was reissued, but this the the new issue had a another section called Michtam Elio, which has material both from manuscripts, newspapers, and askamas, which we'll be discussing also. In two thousand and five, a, a bunch of letters uh, between him and Rav Moshe Bamberger, who was the son of the Wurzburger Rav, which we'll also be discussing in Mitzvah. And more recently, in the past ten years, four volumes of his drushes on Torah have come out. With all this material today, we can properly begin to evaluate this great guy and see why he was so unique. We'll be discussing Amir Tzashem shortly, and one more, an additional discovery in recent years, and then we'll be able to put this all in some proper context. Okay. So you want to discuss now things he spoke about, B'chlolos, Pratim, bring out so, some yeah. of the things he spoke about in his in his um, different writings? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that. So first, we'll start with that. First, why Chagiga? So the answer is, many times when you want to, um, I, many people, uh, fr- friends of mine over the years have issued the following complaint. Sometimes uh, someone finds material of a said gadol and they print it in a journal, but how is one supposed to remember? Uh, let's say they'll say you found the uh, material of, of gadol X Y Z, and um, but how is one supposed to remember when you get to that sugi or that masechta that it exists? There's no, there's not proper indexes of this material. Similarly, sometimes they'll print four volumes of a chedushim of a said gadol, such as Rebelli Gumacher, and but you'll open it up. Let's say here there's Torah of Baba Basra, but it doesn't go from that base straight organized every block. There could be certain sugiyos that he has, and there could be tons of block that there's nothing. So one decides to look at it. Nothing, 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 and then all this, but there's tons of material, so, and you get discouraged. So Chagiga, the mile of Chagiga is that there's a hundred pages of material of Rebel Yigutmacher throughout the whole Masechta, both Agada, both Halacha, and he, he, t- fascinating material. So here is a Masechta that one could properly enjoy him, and without having to worry about it, when you're going to open him up, if it's if he's going to have something to say or not, there's a good chance he's going to have something interesting to say. We see him being very into the Marsha, as is, as well known, his Rabbi Ricky Vega was also into the Marsha. He's very into dealing with the Turi Evan, but he does not shy away from Agadita, which as we know, as we're learning Chagiga now, there's a lot of Agadita. Okay. Shortly we'll discuss some specific things in the Sefer, that his chuvas are also excellent, very thorough, he very, very carefully checked the sources when he wrote about the chuvas. He's Meirich to go through every Prat, showing you how he reaches his conclusions very clearly. He quotes Rishayim that were available to him. He uses Rishalmi if he if he needs to. Um, he shows throughout his work incredible expertise in the Magen Avram, dealing being medayik in different aspects in the Magen Avram. At one point, he calls him the Paisik Achron. All complicated issues of Dalchel Kishulchan are represented in this in this chuvas. It's it's a nice amount of material. He corresponds with fellow Ashkenazi Gedolim. Um, just to mention the Ksava Kabbalah has a few chuvas in here. There's a lot with Rabbi Kiveiger. He deals with different shittas of Rebbe Kivager, discussing them, which we'll discuss. He also deals with, he also is in correspondence with Galitzi Gildaidim, such as the Shalomesha, there's a bunch of chuvas. But Lita is also fairly represented. He has a chuva where he's busy being Meyash of Abir Hagra, Barichos. He has many times quoting both the Chai Adam and the Chachmas Adam, the Nishmas Adam. He has numerous chuvas with the great Litva Shagad, Rabbi Yasser Zachariah Stern. So he's with, he's with everyone. Now, various people claim that he was influenced by Hasidish Aswaram. And we'll see why there could be makam for such a claim. But I do not find Mufurish open such um, open proof for such a thing yet, but it could be it exists. He does quote Shulchan Harav. In, in his work, I'll tell you, I found one place that he does quote openly the Tanya, but not much more than that. But there's not a proper index of his material. It could be a proper index of the, the Torah and Chumash. One will find more um, open Makairis. It could be people that know Hasidic Makairis well, could be they could see, oh, this is really uh, based on it. It could be. But anyway, be that as it may, he kept his chubas very organized. He kept, he kept drafts, and he had dates on them, which many chubas farm don't have dates. So a lot of times you could get perspective from the dates also. He keeps most of the names in there. Now, he clearly kept these chubas, it's clear, to because he was planning on doing to, that it should be printed. Maybe he wasn't going to print it, but he wanted it to be printed. So much so that in one fascinating, one very interesting chuva, we don't even know to the extent of how interesting it is. Someone wrote to him, it seems this person was Iver Various Averis, and he was asking Rebellion Gutmacher what how to do chuva for these things. So, so Gutmacher writes, I'm ripping up your letter so that no one should know what you did. But here I'm keeping what I tell you the chuva that you should do by from Kali for Averis. But obviously it sounds like some but anyway, the point is he was keeping it for it to be printed. 
Okay. More specifically, to quote some ideas that are found in the actual Sefer. So in the Tshuva, there's a fascinating Lushan, um uh, I found fascinating in, in a conversation about Hilchus Kiddush that came up. So he talks about, which is also a, a very a, a very big topic that one could be Meirchan a lot, about forget about forgetting. And so he writes like this. He says, it must be, he was knowing a certain thing, and then it turns out he made a mistake. He, he's Mavar later on that he made a mistake. So he says, maybe when I learned to sugya, and when I, I came to this this and this conclusion, and I and I must have forgotten that I came to the wrong. I, I I forgot. I thought I came to this conclusion. It turns out I'm wrong. And he says it's not a big deal. Shitcha um, is possible even by Malachi Elio. And he says, look at the Rambam. Even the Rambam writes in the Chuvas of Chachmi Lunil with the, his with his Maso Matan back to them that he forgot sources. That he forgot the Rambam himself wrote. He forgot his Makairis. So he also could forget. It could be now. Some people, when you hear such a thing, I'm not going to go into Barichos, but I, I've written a lot about it also, they, they don't like to hear that a Gadol could forget. Here we have open, Rebel Yigutmacher is admitting that at least he was able to forget. Okay. Um, no, another very interesting thing um, is people always talk about the Tzavos of Rebuda Chassid. Um, if you have to, and the amount of literature and Svarim written on Tzavos of Rebuda Chassid is 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 literally incredible. So he, when he talks about the Zavaz Rebbe Chassid, he brings down the famous Shuvah's Nani Yehuda. And Lamaisa, he also comes to the conclusion, similar to Nani Yehuda, that in, and, he, and he says he himself was Nayig with one of his children. They were not Makhbed on the Zavaz Rebbe Chassid. <laughs> I found that very interesting, as we're, we're going to see um, soon through the presentation, that he was very into, into Kabbalah. So it's, it's a sort of a Chiddush. Okay. He has a tshuva where he talks about the Psalm Reish, the famous Psalm Reish. He has an interesting. Um, hold on, the way he gets to it. Well, let me just see where I put it. An uh, interesting question of a, of a of a person. It seems a person who was a, a, a regular normal person in this kihila, um, in a, in a, in the kihila where this person was part of. Suddenly they find he disappeared. It turns out he, he must have had some sort of a breakdown. And he locks himself up, and they they caught him. It seems he tried to commit suicide, but in the end, they saved this person. So the question is, how, in the Holocaust, the, the best way to illustrate it is sometimes if, if people are under crazy, crazy pressure, and they were forced, they, they just couldn't handle it anymore. So the, so it, it comes out from a, from this famous truth, Summer Reich, that we don't look at it as 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 a, as someone committing suicide. Many people had problems with this particular tshuva. This particular tshuva sparked its own debates besides the actual safer. But anyway, he brings it down. And what's one of his riots when he talks about it? He says, not only is it brought down, but it's brought down by my Rebbe, Rebbe Kivager, which is known that people bring down. Rebbe Kivager brings down the Psalm Reish. So it can't be that the Psalm Reish is a forgery. Okay. Anyway, um, in another tshuva, another bibliographical point is he quotes a safer, Mekairi Min Hagim, from his student. And what, what's going on over here? So the so in a, elsewhere it turns out in the newspapers there's a whole article Rebelli Gutmacher defends his student because there was there's a big debate and this debate is still going on until recent years about the authorship of the Sefer Makayim and Hagen. The, a Sefer came out and then someone claimed that it was really his it was stolen and what it, 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 till today people debate about it each one each group try, not because anyone has agendas just trying to prove who was the author of the Sefer. What I have not really seen quoted is Rebelli Gutmacher says that the author is his student and he knows that he didn't plagiarize and it's him and the, the it was play let me say someone did plagiarize a safer, but he plays a, he he takes a side in this machlaikis in the newspapers at the time. Um okay, that's another thing. Another chuva which comes up and he talks about it in a few places is deaf people already in those in that period of time, deaf people, which relates to Hagigo a little bit. Um, where they learned how to talk, how does it play out in halacha? So interesting already in those days when this is um, coming up. Okay. Anyway, um, these are just some of the very sm- as I said. The, there's a, a yam of of material here to properly um, mention all the different things it would take forever. And I have Rahman I do have Rahmanas, so I'm not going to. But um, this is, these are just some of the some of the very very small little um, I like to call them pitchfkes that I I've come across as I look through these look through these chuvas and shortly we'll discuss a few a few more okay Adkan um, about what we see in the actual safe okay you mentioned the uh, cheresh so 
we had Rabbi Shachatavitz from Baltimore who gave oh. Shirim on Oldaf specifically. Um, he's someone who's who spent a lot of time. You know, he actually wrote some Kutresim on cochlear implants and Cheirish and Halacha. So go check those out. Um, oh, okay, fine. So now you want to get back and discuss. You mentioned that he was a, at least that you did. Rabbi Kveger called him that you did. Was there anything more that he had? More of a Shachat Rabbi Kveger and other people of that of the day that are worth talking about? Right. So I'm gonna, the main thing I want to focus on is with uh, right now is a little bit more about with him and Rabbi Kveger. Okay, so to start with is that there was, it seems there was a, a big shayla in those days. Um, this is about on Pesach. I guess they had a way to make schnapps, and it seems some um, to, uh, some form of making schnapps that some people held as a problem of chametz, and other people held as not a problem of chametz. Rabbi Kivager, for some reason, was very strong and held it's a problem. There's no ways around it. You cannot have this on Pesach. Okay. And he wrote about it, and we have chuvas about it from Rabbi Kivega. It seems afterwards, after he dies, they, they, um, I guess maybe they felt they fixed up the issues that Rabbi Kivega had, and they asked Rabbi Yigutmacher about it. And Rabbi Yigutmacher very, very carefully is medayik in every word of what Rabbi Kivega says, and he comes out to be mekel. And and but we see he's how he's so being metiaches to everything that his Rabbi Rabbi Kivega says, how to deal with it. The Maisa. Rabbi Kivager's son, his friend, Rabbi Shleim Eger, um, I mean, Rabbi Yigutmacher's friend, Rabbi, Rabbi Shleim Eger does not says, no, my father held, um, it, he would not have agreed with all these different things. And, okay. But you see, what, what was interesting in the whole Dion is the Lashayin is back and forth, how he um, is mitiaches, how he's, his, his yichus with, his, with the Rabbi Kivager. In another tshuva, he has, which, which, it comes up at a yom often enough in the tshuva and yeridayim and peizayim, which is it gets into the topic of what is one allowed to teach a ger, which halakim of Torah is one allowed to teach a ger, which also is a sugya relating to in chagiga. And in the course of this tshuva, at one point, someone brings up a Rabbi Kivager about it, and he and he doesn't want to argue with Rabbi Kivager, but in the end, he does argue with Rabbi Kivager, and you see again how he's being very careful. Now, he says, I'm not going to really just stand, come out and argue, even though he has his reasons why, from the Sugius, why he argues on Rabbi Kivager. But he says, not only that, um, um, he finds a Shulti Gibayrim, which already, based on a Shulti Gibayrim, it would be okay for him. It says like him, and he says, I'm clear if my Rabbi Rabbi Kivager would have it, it could be he would say otherwise. He would, he would agree with me. Now, what, what's this relate, what does this relate to? If one could teach... Um, what, as I said, it's the question is what could one teach a um, a ger before he actually is Megayer? So his conclusion is that Taira that Navi, that Navi and Suvim would be mutter. That's his conclusion. And when it talks about Taira, it's referring to mitzvahs. The problem to teach a, a, a guy Taira is referring to specifically mitzvahs. And he brings a very interesting raya. Could be others bring this raya, but he talks about that in the beginning of Chumash Barashis, until until partial into Shemais, we find that it's not really about there's no there's not mitz, there's no mitzvahs. What is it? It's really the Sipurim of the Nisim and the Briya Sa'ilam and the story with, with the Avais, etc. How do we know this? We have Rashi in the Mamish one, the, fir, the first Rashi, which everyone loves to talk about for some reason or other, that so he says from here we he wants to deduce from this Rashi also as a proof that we see that how the guy is going to know this. So it seems that until until the parish of that would be mutter for a guy to know about. So basically to teach a ger, neviim, suvim, or chumash parashas and shemais. Would be mutter. This is his chiddush. Obviously, this is there's a lot to talk about over here because um, kiyadua. There's a lot. There, there is a lot of um, halacha that is able to be learned out of chumash bereishis until this point. A lot to talk about. But the kitzur. I just want to show interesting, uh, like an interesting way how he thinks. In, it's obviously a tshuva with a few pages and and to deal with it. But this is one prat in the tshuva. Okay. Anyway. We, but I, what's clear is throughout his writings, he has tremendous, tremendous cover for Rabbi Kivega. Tre, tremendous cover. 
So I want to just quote two small things, and then we'll move on uh, relating to this also. So I, I mentioned that one of the svarim that was put out is this is called Mikhtav Melio, and it's a collection of a material from letters, manuscripts, and stuff that was printed by So one such piece is that he talks about. Um, he says like this. When he talks about Rabbi Kivega, hold on. When he talks about, someone wrote a Sefer, and in the Sefer it seems the person is Miyashiv questions of Rabbi Kivega. So there's a lot of legendary stories about these types of things. Some people say, chutzpah, how could he be Miyashiv Rabbi Kivega's questions? Here you have Rabbi Gutmacher, Talmud of Rabbi Kivega, says no. Ad it's not a Khalila and it's not a Pugia and his covet if he Ad Rabbi Kivega will want us to answer his questions. And even and and the fact that this person wants to try to answer it, it's not a problem. And he's willing to he's not he doesn't have any problems that this person went out to answer up Rabbi Kivega's questions, which I found very interesting because always in Yeshiva, I always used to hear different people, um, I guess it's some type of, of Yeshiva lore. That uh, to answer Rabbi Kivega's questions, and if Rabbi Kivega couldn't come up with the answer, then there's no answers. But this is what um, Rabbi Yigotmacher writes. Now, Skamata Sefer. Okay, but furthermore, he also writes one second, one other lashon. He says that the he says about the Galus Rabbi Kivega, Rabbi Kivega, which there's other sources that that also say this. Rabbi Kivega had Yisurim his whole life. And he learned with great Yisurim. So he says there's a Meir Dikaschus when you learn from his Svarim, where you have them as his Svarim in his house. It give, it's a Meir Dikaschus for a person um, to learn from them. This is he, this he writes when they wanted to print over Rabbi Kivega's Hagois on Chaysha Mishpat. This is also a tremendous, um, powerful statement about Rabbi Kivega. Okay. Now, learning, in, uh, um, learning uh, just to conclude this part with one last Nakuda, relating to Chagiga, again, relating to Shabishim and Chagiga. So in Chagiga, in one of the pieces, so he talks about, I found that uh, I'm, I'm going through the uh, Rebel Yigotmacher, and I come across an interesting, um, I wish I didn't mark it off, give me a second, an interesting discussion, which he talks about, uh, Arichos, and in, co- in the course of this discussion, he says as follows. Um, he talks about the Matargim Ha'an Ashkenazi. That, um, and then he talks about him, that he, the, one of the problems is that he made the Torah accessible to Goyim, which is problematic. And then he talks about something specifically in the translation of this of this Targum Ashkenazi. And then he says, Lemaisa, and then he brings down a whole shakal Torah from his son about it. And he, basically, what he wants to talk about is similar. Is uh, is this is, was um, this Matargam Ashkenazi? Was he over on the aspect of making Tyra available to Goyim, which we just mentioned that, and which is a, relating into Chagiga, to teach Tyra to Goyim? Okay, so the question is, who was this Matargam Ashkenazi? What's going on here? So turns out, this Matargam Ashkenazi he's referring to is Mendelssohn. Okay, he's referring to Mendelssohn. Turns out. Um, Again, just just um, very 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 bekitzer. The there was a fellow; he's still alive, named Mayor Hilzenheimer. He wrote extensively about the the German gedolim and the usage of Mendelssohn, and he shows documents that many many gedolim in the Germ, German German which is significant, but we're not going to get into why it's so significant. They quote Mendelssohn Kaseder. One such gadol, he says in the manuscripts going through of Rebellion Gutmacher, over 20 times he quotes Mendelssohn's beer. He, but furthermore, is Rebbe Kiva Eger, two things. A, Rebbe Kiva, so I, um, what I'm adding to the story is, and which also I know about it also, besides for seeing it myself, but this guy mentions it also, is Rebbe Kiva Eger also does such a thing. One is he gives us skama to one of the editions of Mendelssohn's beer that comes out in the 1830s. Um, a later edition, but it has the beer of Mendelssohn in it, and he knows about it. And in the in a fight, in the controversies with the reform, Rabbi Kivega quotes in in a, in a piece of a tshuva the beer of Mendelssohn. So it's not so unique that we have over here Rebellion Gutmacher quoting the beer of Mendelssohn. What's shot in this? Obviously, this is Arichas Gadol, and we're not here to which we're, we're actually trying to keep it 
to a normal amount of time. Ad kan, these are some of the things that we have that we, um, with the relationship with his with Rabbi Kiva Eger on the level of regular nigla dika um, and halacha dika things, um, their relationship, his yachas with him, and he, and we see over here a very interesting thing in Bechlal. Even though he's a tremendous, tremendous chassid, so to speak, of Rabbi Kiva Eger, he held that, that Rabbi Kiva Eger also would hold that it's not a problem to argue as long as it's substa- as long as it's based on something. Okay, ad kan this. Okay, well, fascinating, fascinating. Seems like you go on and on and on and on and on. Okay, so you mentioned Nigla. That means that there must be things that are Mr. Rosso from Rebali Gutmacher. Is he involved in okay. Kabbalah? I know you mentioned that Hasidus, um, you haven't found. But we have to mention, obviously, if people, you know, the audience wants to send you McCurtis email. Please, or please, we're definitely Certainly should. Okay, so um, how about you want to discuss his involvement in the Kabbalah, Kfitlach, and things like that? Okay, so let now I would like to conclude with one last chilek with with Rebelli Gutmacher, and this will be able to put a little bit um, uh, put a lot of things that we mentioned up till now in deeper context. This is as follows: There's a claim that was made. I see. I see it in, in various writings about about Rebelli Gutmacher that he saw Rebbe Kiva Eger's um, Zayar, Zaharus on Zayar, and that sparked him to learn Kabbalah or something. I've yet to find if Rabbi Kiveger, where, where this came from, um, where he's supposed to say this, but it could be it exists because there's many manuscripts, as I said. But he does quote in a different place in his Chedusha Manchas that he saw the Agais of Rabbi Kiveger on his riff, so, and he quotes a piece from that he saw there. But about the Zayar, I don't know. However, Rabbi Kivager and the Zayar, we do find the mashal. I'm just looking in the first parak and brachas, Rabbi Kivager quotes the Zayar a few times, but that doesn't necessarily mean um, so much. Um, it doesn't mean that he's a makubal or not. But further evidence about Rabbi Kivager, I'm trying to go in order, is Rabbi Kivager being a makubal can be found in Rabbi Yosef Avivi's masterpiece on the Arizal. He brings down that there's a Ma'iris Nasan from the Nasan Shapiro Aksavya that was we know was in the in possession of Rabbi Kiveger, and it has Hagoyis in the handwriting of Rabbi Kiveger on the side. Okay, but more than that, we don't really know what Rabbi Kiveger's Yachas to Kabbalah was. It could very well be it was hidden. There is one interesting source about this, about Rabbi Kiveger, that would show some type of Yachas with Kabbalah. There's two, this, sorry, there's three different. Sources that I like to mention with Rabbi Kivega's Yachas with Kabbalah. And that will lead us to Rebel Yagutmacher. Number one is found in a. Hold on. We find a few places where Rabbi has some Kameyas. We find um, some Segulas of Rabbi Kivega, but again, heavy duty Kabbalah uh, it doesn't mean that, that he wasn't into it. We just don't have it. It could be he kept it hidden. There's an autobiography of a fellow that learned by both Rabbi Kiveger and he also learned by Rebel Yigotmacher. And this fellow, he he describes meeting Rabbi Kiveger the first time. And he wrote and he writes as follows. He comes into the house where Rabbi Kiveger is sitting, he sees an old man, and all, above the head of Rabbi Kiveger, he says, there was a stag's head filled with shamos over the private door of this world famed teacher. I trembled in every limb, I really imagined it and glared at me. Okay, now it seems is that there was Shemais that somehow came from Rabbi Naftali, and Rabbi Kivega checked them out, and he saw them, and this is a autobiography that this person who learned by Rabbi Kivega is saying over, he's seeing it. Now it's been printed, this autobiographical piece, which is coming from an English book of someone that learned by Rabbi Kivega, was printed in Hebrew in, in the beautiful edition of Igris Rabbi Kivega, but they don't say where they got the whole um, piece from. From this English book, okay, I don't know why not, but um, bottom line is that there's something to do with Kabbalah, and I said there's a few they collected over the years a few different kameyas of Rabbi Kiveger. But, but what does that have to do with Rebelli Gutmacher? So Rebelli Gutmacher, it seems when you look when you look if you Google him, you'll see that a lot of times in auctions they auction off kameyas from Rebelli Gutmacher. It comes up all the time. Rebel Yugutmacher, a German Gadol, Kameas, what's going on? Is it a fake? Is it real? Okay. Now, from looking through his chuvis and looking through his material, we could see that Rebel Yugutmacher was a completely different, he was a he was a different type of person than we think. 
Mamish could be uh, more closely associated with Hasidim. Lamashal, in his recent work that was printed on Bamidbar, he has two pages, Barichas, about his, what Kavanas he had when he would go into the mikvah. Two pages of Kabbalah. Um, in his svarim throughout, we see incre- we do see by him incredible knowledge in Kabbalah, in Arizal, and all different types of things. He even uses it with Halacha. But more than that, one of the only chuvas of his that was printed, probably the earliest chuva that was actually printed from his, was printed in the back of a, a booklet called Zichron Shleima in 1923. And this, in 1933, sorry. And in this chuva, somehow, he was upset about um, that there was, a, there was a shul without a proper mechitza. And I think he told off the Rav that it's not proper, and the Rav didn't listen, the, whatever, and basically it says, he, he Rav Elia Gutmacher describes in this tshuva that basically after the shul was renovated, it collapses, and he and this Rav dies in the middle of his drasha, a drasha mishuna. Okay. So again, if we were a Hasidim, we would automatically associate that there's something has to do with you know, that he didn't listen to Rebelli Gutmacher telling him, Rebelli Gutmacher is the one recording this story, but he, do, he doesn't say that that's why it happened. Okay. Anyway, when you, um, I mentioned that there's letters between Rebelli Gutmacher and Ramesh Abadir. In these letters, all of a sudden, I start, I'm, I start going through these letters, and I see he, he's constantly, he asks more than once, Rebelli Gutmacher, to please write for me a Kamea. And Rebelli Gutmacher writes back to him, it's not so posh to write it. I have to have the right frame of mind. It takes, it's not, you can't just write it. But but the point is, it, it comes up time and time again. <laughs> and he does write him Kameas. But it come, But we're talking about two German G'dayla. We're not talking about two Hasidish Arabis. Um, we're talk, um, that's what I'm trying to emphasize. Okay, I guess I, get my, I guess my point is clear. Now, there's a true, there's a letter between Ramesha Bamberger and Rebelli Gutmacher about a, the schooler when you look at the case of Avdala. It's a page about that. And looking through some, again, not all the letters are about this, but some of the letters are. There's more, which, there's a whole letter by Rikos about dreams, how to interpret dreams. Um, something that I guess, if I showed it to a chassid, there's a schooler about Kishuf. A whole discussion, a page and a, a page, almost a page. If I showed this to a chassid and I would tell him, that a German is having this type of uh, letters back and forth, two German gedolim, they'd be shocked. Uh, the Germans, in the Hasidic world especially, they have a saga Hasidim, um, that Germans are very cult, but here we have two German gedolim writing back and forth about Kameis, about um, Kabbaldic and stuff. Okay, but okay, but I, but this is not so, okay, big deal, not so much. What happens? I said, so first I said is that if you look around and you Google Rebel Gumach, you'll see a lot of times his name comes up for for um, Kvitlach of his. Kvitlach of his. Okay. A fascinating thing happens. In 1932, a group of people discovered in an attic in the Kehillah where Rebellion Gutmach was almost 7,000 Kvitlach of Rebellion Gutmach. Not 10 Kvitlach, not 15 Kvitlach. 7,000 Kvitlach that were written to Rebellion Gutmach. That's an incredible amount. There is, just to understand this in perspective, there is no Kvitlach that exists of almost any Rebbe today, of previous G'day. Now, it could be, just like everything else, Baruch Hashem, we live in a generation, there's a Sefer called Hilchas Kvitl, so you have to check up the Halachas of a Kvitl, but in, in, in Hilchas Kvitl, it seems you're not supposed to keep Kvitlach, but it's all based on um, the, the Makayrus of the Sefer is, is a Yesh Laden Harbe, a lot about it, we won't get into it, but here we have 7,000 Kvitlach that Rebellion Gutmacher clearly kept. What are we going to see from these kvitlach? We're going to discuss in a moment. So first, um, there's a fellow, not Jewish, his name is Marcin Wodinsky. He wrote a book called Historical Atlas of Hasidim, and he analyzes where all these kvitlach are coming from, the cities in this book, um, where these kvitlach are coming from. Now, more, now these kvitlach today exist, there, uh, many of them are in Yivo, and others are found in Hebrew University. You, you could see some of them online, um, um, of these kvitlach. So someone went, an uh, 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 academic person, and he went, and he went to try to analyze some of the stuff that we could see from this, from these kvitlach. Because you, you have to understand, when a person wrote a kvitl in those days, they assume no one's going to see these kvitlachs, only the person who it's being sent to, the Hainu Rebel Yigotmacher. So they are very open in these letters, and everything, every aspect of life is discussed in these kvitlach. They could write a whole page, Barichos, about whatever problems they're having, and we see 
incredible insight historically of what's going on in those in, in those days. This is the 1870s. Now, it's not clear if these are 7,000, that's all he received, or this is from a short period of time, because we know, and he, he writes this constantly, that he's constantly being swamped with material. People are asking him questions, and people are sending. So much so, that he took out an ad in the newspaper asking people to stop sending him kvitlach. Because there was so much, the post office was complaining to him that they're not able to handle the volume of material that's coming to him. Now, besides for all the chubas that are also coming to him, and stam letters, which we see, just look at Ramesha Bamberger, his goggle, there's tons of letters back and forth. The manuscripts also show tons of letters, correspondences with tons of gadolim. He was involved in many different things. There's also kvitlich coming in by the tons. And he stops, but it doesn't really help. Um, this is in the newspapers in those times. You can see the newspaper article, seeing is believing. But at that time, when someone reads that newspaper, they don't know what, what's going on. What is he talking about? Fitler coming that. But in 1932, many years afterwards, and we have them today, we see at least 7,000 such Fitler. No, there's no such thing existing from any Rebbe today. Okay, now, what, so what do we see from these Fitler? Okay, so I'm just going to mention very briefly two, uh, two, three things, and then we'll be able to see a little bit more about it. How this even started? Uh, how did, why do people start sending him Kvitlach? He's a he's a German person, a German Talmud Chacham. He's not a rabbi. He doesn't have Tish. He doesn't have Hasidim. What's happens to sending him Kvitlach? So there's a book called Yankel's Tavern: Jews, Liquor, and Life in the Kingdom of Poland. Okay, so this book talks about um, Jews and as I just mentioned, all these aspects. So people, I don't know, I, I, I sometimes read, there's a magazine that comes out weekly called the Mishpacha. And in recent uh, months, there's been discussion about drinking and people have problems with drinking and that. So the question is, was this a new problem or an old problem? You open up this book and you'll see that this is an old problem. Jews and being drunk and drinking also existed earlier on. Without, I'm, I have no intention of getting into this right now. By Richos, there's a lot to say about it. But in the Kvitlach of Rebelli Gutmacher, women wrote in to him, my husband's a drunk. Please help. He was a great guy. And then he started drinking alcohol. Please help him get back onto his way, to the proper way. And there's not one such Kvitl, at least 10, 12, that he, print, that he prints. They didn't, print, they didn't go through all 12,000. Anyway, we see that what happens always happens. Okay, anyway, what else do we see from these Kvitlach? So this, the, um, they asked many times, we, uh, people always heard these stories that Jews were the ta- owned the taverns. But, and what happened is the guy didn't pay up. Taka, we see from these kvillach, these people were complaining about it, that the guy are taking over my business and they're not paying and I'm having tsaris and everything. He analyzes, he's able to see from the ma- various amounts what people were doing, what the debts that the guy and Taka owed them, because they're complaining to him, they're asking him to do some type of mifus to help it. Now, Interestingly enough, in at least more than one, they, they sort of like, could you get rid of my enemy? Get rid of my enemy because the guy is causing problems. Pretty much do some type of Kabbalah to make him disappear, so to speak. But all this is found in these thousand kvitlach and then some. There's much, much more going on in these kvitlach. Okay. Now, after you see this, that you, you see we have this person, so there's two questions that need to be asked. One is, how does this happen? How does he become known as a Balmaifis? Okay, so the answer is that Rebelli Gutmacher himself tells us, and, he, and in 18, I mentioned, what Sefer did he print in his lifetime? The Sefer Tzafnas Panech. Incredible Sefer. It deals with the Gemara Sarah Barbachana, and he was known about Kabbalah, even that he writes about that Goyim even found out that he's great into Kabbalah, and he had all kind of, he talks about Goyim and Kabbalah. He's not, a, he's not pro it at all, but he talks about it. And then, he had, in the first Mimer already, he talks about Kabbalah, Mysias, and if it's Mutter to Davin, or, or, or say Kabbalah, or do say Tfilais to get rid of one's enemies. And I'm reading this simon, and this is a simon relating to Sogis and Brachas and other places in Shas, and there's lots of Makairis about this. It's a, a very big topic. And it's very interesting. What's going on over here? Why is he talking about this? Like in Simon Aleph and his Mimer, but when you see this, some of the Kvitlach that people are asking, you can understand, because some of the Kvitlach people really were asking him this, if one could down for the enemies. Now, when one learns through Kabbalah Svarim, Maisa Svarim, Kabbal- Kabbalah Dika Skulus type of Svarim, one will see many times that there are Kvitlach how to get rid of enemies, how to get rid of robbers, had to die. So, it's understood now with what he was being asked, why he's dealing with it in a halacha dika sense. Okay, anyway, that's in the first Maimur in the Safra Pech. Then he talks about, we're, we're reaching towards the end, he talks about um, how does he become known? 
how does why all of a sudden do people start sending him Fitluch? So he writes in the Tzafras Paneach. He's sitting with Talmidim, he's learning, and someone brings him a, a young a father, brings his son, 11 year old child, and basically he says, This son, uh, no one knows what's going on with him. He, sometimes he acts like um, he, a voice, like a dog comes out, sometimes like a cow, and all different types of things without getting tarichos, and no one has, Pashut Mo, he's complaining about um, problems from his stomach, and no one knows what to do with him. He said, so really good. Well, says, I have nothing to do. I'm, I'm not a doctor. There's nothing I can do about it either. He says, okay, you know what? Maybe I'll be able to do something. So he takes a safer to heal him. And I say to heal him with great Tavana. And nothing happens. Okay. But he says, leave him here. And the father leaves the son here. And a few, um, he did it a few times. Nothing happens. One day he comes back from a pity in a ben. And he says, maybe I'll be able to be paid him just like this. And he says, capital to heal him. And Lamaisa, the son gets back to normal. And it becomes a, a myriadic, uh, um, everyone's mamish nespal. And he describes at length what happens, which is similar to stories that many people have heard or read, where um, um, different, I guess, for uh, um, things come out of the this kid. Machshefa has come out, and they um, all different types of, I guess, similar stories that people hear about with Dibukim, this is pretty much what's happening. But the pro- the Nakud over here is this is Rebelli Gutmacher writing this himself, describing what happened in his what with his Yeshiva Bachar. But he keeps on saying he's not a Makubal. He he doesn't he doesn't know he's he just did what he did was his regular tefillas with great kavana. That's what he keeps on emphasizing. And, and learning, he keeps on emphasizing that also. It seems from this he became known more and more as a great Makubal, and then People just started sending him fitluch and more and more. And as I said, the mail got flooded. And he, he has another he talks about another story over here in the Tzafras Paneach. This is a Maimla test. And pretty much because of all this, he now in his work on Chagiga, he talks about Barichos, about the Kayach of a tzadik. And we find Rabbi Kivager even dav, asking him to Davin. And Rabbi Schleimager asks him to Davin. And we find that he, he had this Kayach, as I wrote to you with Ramesha Bamberger. But we see him. What I'm, what I'm trying to bring out from all this is that he was a. He, he writes about what happened, the success, and the success. It became famous, even though he's use he's you trying to make it as natural as possible, and he even uses the lashon. He says it's chaval that apikarsim were not standing here because if they would see it, they would be able to understand what it means that there are things beyond teva. He, he himself can't even understand what's going on. He say, okay. Anyway, Ad Khan, this is the point that he becomes this major. We have here a case of a non-Hasidic person who becomes a Rebbe. From all over the world, Fitlach are coming to him. They survive. They exist till today. Thousands of them. This fascinating Jewish history that one could see. And we see him with all this and putting together, we can understand um, why we find in his Chubis a lot of Inyanim of Kabbalah discussions, um, Inyanim of Beis Akvaris, and his Sefer Sukkah Shalom also discusses with how to deal with life after death, how to do chesed for a dead for a dead person, for parents, so to speak. And he talks about it in a halachadika concept, but using Kabbalah. And that's why in his other Svarim, something, it's not so, it's a, it's sort of a Chiddush, because people don't really, we don't really find so commonly that a German Gadol to be such a grace and a kubble. That's why certain people think he's a Chassid Sherab Mamash, Kach. But here we have a great Talmud of Rabbi Kiveger. Possibly he might have gotten some of this from Rabbi Kiveger, but here we have him playing in this. Um, I guess we have a German non Hasidic Balmaifis who was famous in his lifetime. And as I said, even though there was many years that he became forgotten, but in recent years we have all his Taira, Nigla, Nistar, and these Kvitlach, which make him put him in an interesting light. Um, Adkan. Thank you.